This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on that later. Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achona. Welcome back to the Code Review series, everyone's favorite series that you have all missed over the last like month or two. For those of you who don't know, this is the series where you guys send me all of your suspicious code and I take a look at it. It's honestly amazing that I haven't like gotten all my files deleted yet. So last time we took a look at a ray tracer in C++ and made it a whole lot faster. I'll have that video linked up there so you can check it out. Today, we're going to step away a little bit from the ray tracers. Uh, I know a lot of you are really interested in that and there'll be more on that coming later. But today I thought we would take a look at this. So Griffin Thompson has sent us Gar Engine, an engine in C Sharp. Who would have thought we'd be taking a look at C Sharp on this channel? So Gar Engine, very interesting name, uh, <laughs> is an engine I'm writing in C Sharp to learn about how OpenGL works and to eventually get a career. I'm currently 16, studying computer science in my spare time. Just recently I implemented shadows, screw shadow mapping. Yeah, it can be definitely difficult if it's your first time. I hope you can give me some expertise in game engine design or an engine design, since I'm new to the doing this kind of work. Although it is written in C Sharp, I think you can compare it to C++. Well, we'll see about that. I like that this person has included a screenshot. Pro tip, if you're trying to actually get me to review a code, is try and make it as interesting as possible. And here is a GitHub repository link. Let's take a look. So it seems like this takes me to like some subfolder called GE Silk. Okay, cool. So this is it, C-sharp engine, features directional shadows, pseudo PBR, SSAO, Bloom, IBL, ECS, render frame buffers. This looks pretty, pretty well developed. Now this being a C-sharp engine, I mean, it comes with a solution file. I'm not sure how this is gonna work for people not running Windows. My plan is obviously just gonna be to open this in Visual Studio. We'll just go ahead and clone it into a directory. I always do a recursive clone, just in case. And hey, Cherno. What's up? Can you come over and help me traverse this bio entry? Ha hang on, man. I'm just recording a video. Look, I can't do this and I need your help. Can you just come over and do this for me? Just like look it up online, watch a video or something. I already have. I've watched all the videos on bio trees and I still don't get it. Have you tried Brilliant? What's that? Is that one of those course websites? Well, kind of, but like they actually have practical examples. They ask you questions, they quiz you, all that stuff. So you actually learn the content and remember it. Huh, that sounds great. Tell me more. Brilliant is a website filled with courses on STEM topics, but the thing that separates them from a lot of other similar websites is that they are all about learning interactively. These courses do not just push videos into you and then you, it's up to you to do literally the rest. They are interactive. As you can see, they have a lot of computer science related topics that I think will be really interesting to you guys. So if we actually do take a look at binary trees, Brilliant does really well at like presenting you with some information, showing you some diagrams and then asking you questions about it, which you have to answer. The reason why I love this is because most people learn by doing. Most people learn through practical means. If you are just taking in a lot of theory, that is pretty much useless. You need that practical experience and Brilliant is brilliant at providing you with that. Aside from learning a wide range of computer science specific topics, as I mentioned, they do have a lot of math. And actually, if we take a look at the computer science algorithms, you'll see they also have some neural network content, which I'm actually going to go through. These courses have really clear intuitive explanations and they're suitable for all skill levels. And their courses are actually quite fun. Tim and I actually went through the binary search course earlier today and it kept us engaged the whole way through. So go ahead and visit Brilliant using the link in the description below. You can get started, as I mentioned, for free, but Brilliant also has a special offer. The first 200 of you who do sign up for an annual membership using the link in the description below will receive 20% off. Go ahead and give it a go. I genuinely think a lot of you will find it extremely helpful and it will teach you lots. Huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. All right, so once that has all completed, Gar Engine public. Let's go ahead and just open that directory and we'll see what we've got. Solution, let's open that. Yeah, I'm kind of excited to take a look at this. Looks nicely organized here. Program.cs, I assume, is the entry point. Static void main, nice and clean. That's what I like to see. So it looks like there's two projects here. GES, GES, GESILK, GESILK, and Gar Engine. They both look suspiciously similar. This one's a startup project. Let's go ahead and run this. Although I remember that he did point to this one in the email. So I am I think maybe this is different, but let's just go ahead and start this up and we'll see what happens. Okay, so it's on my other monitor. Here it is. This is what it looks like. Looks like we have a skybox. We have a 3D model with some kind of like specular reflection over here. We have some transparency in the leaves, which is cool. Uh, and over here, this looks like part of Sponza actually. And we have the archways. Uh, I'm not really seeing any shadows or anything of use here. Um, there is also a console window that opened 
And uh, let's see if we can resize that and take a look at what this is saying. Okay, stuff is happening. That must be the frame time, interesting. Now I wanna take a look at the other one as well because that is that is the one that he linked in fairness. Okay, here we go. So this seems to have a shadow and otherwise looks the same. It's got a nice uh, skybox. Can't tell if the bloom is coming in or not. Does that look bloomy to you guys? Maybe like a little bit? He did say he had bloom though. And I'm trying to look for the SSAO as well, which I'm, I guess that could be SSAO. It's really hard to tell, especially because this thing is spinning. But I mean, yeah, it looks like a, an interesting engine. Um, it's running at VSync over here for me. Uh, and where we just ran a debug build as well. So let's dig into this and see what we can say about the code. So the first thing is the entry point, right? Really simple. Now I want a, a quick disclaimer here. I, uh, I do know C Sharp, but I'm not like, I wouldn't call myself a C Sharp expert. Um, I'm obviously more of like a C++ programmer. I work on game engines. C Sharp is something that I more or less use for scripting and for games. Now, back when I worked at EA, I did a fair amount of tools programming. So basically worked on like the like editor as well. And a lot of EA's tools, not just like the Frostbite ecosystem, but also other tools are written in C Sharp. And I did kind of write a bunch of them as well. So I have quite a lot of C Sharp experience, but definitely not as much as C++. And as I mentioned, most of it these days, like since I left EA, has been like, you know, writing games like in Hazel because Hazel uses C Sharp for scripting as well. So uh, it's gonna be interesting to me to take a look at this and see what I can say. And in general, do you guys wanna see more C Sharp? If you do, let me know in the comment section below because otherwise like I've been somewhat selecting C or C++ code reviews most of the time. Okay, so public static class program with a private static window. Now this question mark, if I am not mistaken, means that it is an optional. Now why, but this is a class, so <laughs> what does that even mean? This is awkward. I don't even know what this means. So f so from my ultra quick Google search, it is a nullable type as I thought, but it's a class. Classes are already nullable types. I'm just not sure why you need this in this case because can't you just like, you know, a non-nullable field window. What? But it's a class. Prior to C sharp eight, all reference types were nullable. So they've changed this now. Nullable reference type refers to a group of features introduced in early the likelihood of your code caused the runtime to throw a null reference exception. You can use annotations that can declare whether a variable is a nullable reference type or a non-nullable reference type. So a reference isn't supposed to be null. So they have made it so that if something can be null and null is a valid value for something, then you have to use a question mark. And then you can use like the null forgiving operator. What is all of this? Following a variable name to force the null state to be not null. For example, if you know the name variable isn't null, but the compiler is a warning, you can write this to override the compiler's analysis. I see. So if I understand this correctly, the compiler wants us to be like, no, no, uh, you have to basically tell me that like, you know what you're doing by specifying question mark to be, to make this now nullable so that I don't give you warnings, even though I'm sure this code would execute fine, right? It's just the danger of this code and it keeps popping up on my other monitor because this isn't my main display. But um, because I guess the problem is that it sees this as a potential pitfall, right? Because if you were to execute this code, then of course it would crash because window is null and you're trying to dereference like a null pointer here to call the run function on it, right? And it would be obviously upset at this. There's your null reference exception in a very blurry fashion. However, if you do this, then, well, like, again, that doesn't really change the behavior, does it? But the idea is you could maybe do a question mark dot run or whatever, in which case it just would not run the run function since window is null, or you can be like, no, it's definitely there, in which case, of course, it would crash because you just lied to it. So I still don't really understand the purpose of this other than like, just maybe some kind of, like, what is this? This is supposed to be some kind of annotation for the compiler to get rid of that warning because you're like, it's nullable. So therefore, as the programmer, I'm allowing it to be null. 
But that's weird because that's that's not really how my brain works. In my brain, <laughs> let's talk about my brain for a second. In my brain, this is a class, so therefore it already is implicitly this whole question mark thing, right? Whereas, whereas in the past, you know, what this was used for is if you have like a struct in C-sharp, structs are not nullable. So there's no way you could do something like this. Like that just is not code that would compile, right? Because that's not nullable. So what do you do? Well, you can make this specifically a nullable variable, right? So the type is nullable now and you can have null just like you can with like an integer where if it's, you can assign it to something or you can keep it as null like this, but obviously an int can't be assigned null to if it's just like that. So I guess they've extended this to classes now. I seriously did not know that. Let's change the name of the series real quick. Not code review, but rather channel learn C sharp. I did not know this. This is apparently classes are like not. Apparently classes, what, what this guy had was he had a question mark here. Right. And uh, the reason he has this is because this obviously initially is null, right? Like he didn't right, create yeah. something. And so these days apparently C sharp is not happy with you if you remove this because even though it's a class, like this isn't a struct or something that isn't nullable, yeah. like it's a class still uh -huh. that can be assigned null, but still it's like, whoa, null, like are you sure that's what you want? And if you are sure, then apparently you're supposed to use question marks everywhere to basically indicate to the compiler that you're class like that null is an okay value for this variable to be okay that's wild anyway let's get back to the code review this is this is why i stick to c plus plus so we initialize the window class over here which just sets up some variables and like there's a bunch of boilerplate stuff here that no one probably cares about and then we run run i'm assuming sets up okay so it sets up some functions here to call so these are basically just like events. So glo globals, okay, I love my globals class. <laughs> globals, window, and then load. Uh, and these are all like actions, which are just, yeah. So we have our events here that we can call. Oh, we can add, basically add functions too, so that when that event is raised, it calls on load. Uh, another good feature of C Sharp is obviously that whole like event system that they have on update and render. So we basically set all of these up. now. Global's window, and window is a game window. So we have two different kind of window classes. I guess we've got a window, and then we've got something called a game window, which is, uh, I'm assuming the game window is more or less like the application, like what I would call the application class in Hazel. I can't even find it anywhere. Global's, uh, Global's contains a game window. So where is the game window? Oh, hang on. Oh, that's an OpenTK thing. Oh, okay. Oh, right, okay. So game window is an OpenTK thing, which by the way, for those of you who don't know, OpenTK is like uh, something, it's like a library that allows you to use OpenGL inside C Sharp. It's kind of like LWJGL for Java, I guess. Um, it's very similar to that. Uh, and I'm not sure if it includes, yeah, so it includes a mathematics library as well, which is quite useful. So if you want to use like OpenGL and C Sharp for some reason, then <laughs> you can do so using OpenTK. All right, globals window run. So that just calls that function. And I guess this is probably something that like is inside OpenTK and that, yeah, initializes the up update thread. And that's like kind of the game loop. Oh, here's all the code. Um, and then, yeah, then we get our kind of while loop, right? And you can see it actually internally uses GLFW. So this is all kind of very similar to like a normal C++ architecture that for those of you who watch my channel are probably aware about, um, but this is all happening kind of in C sharp and it's basically using those libraries and it's got those bindings so it can call back into the C++ code of like GLFW and whatever OpenGL like wrapper it's using um, to actually execute that code. Okay, so the rest of all of this. Now this person, I think in their email wanted some feedback on like the engine design. Right, and they are 16. Like 16 is, is definitely very young. I started programming when I was 16. Like 16 was like when I f wrote my first line of code. Um, so we'll try, we'll try our best here to kind of give some insight into what's going on. But basically like, okay, so when I'm looking at stuff, I like to collapse everything. Control ML is what I use there uh, to just, it's like a little chord. So control M and then you keep holding control and then you press L. Uh, and then you get into like this view where it just collapses absolutely everything. From here, I like to, um, and this is like, this is like the kind of 
probably the best raw Visual Studio way of doing this, I think, and it's also very fast, as you can see. If you've got Visual Assist, you can just press Alt-M and it will show you like all of the functions, but this, I find, gives you a really nice overview of the class. So you can see like immediately what we've got here. And when I'm looking through code, especially architecturally, I like to kind of collapse everything so that I can get like an overview of the code. Now, if, if you're really fancy, um, I, I don't know why I thought of this, but Visual Studio actually has some tools uh, especially if you're using C Sharp, something that's like a managed language and Visual Studio supports a lot of really kind of deep stuff with C Sharp that it just doesn't with C++ because C++ is very complicated. It's compiled and all of that. Whereas C Sharp is like a managed language and like there's just a lot more kind of introspection and like reflection and a lot of stuff that it can do with language a lot easier than with C++. So basically they have better tools is what I'm trying to say for it. Um, that's why they have like this one reference and stuff and you can see where it's called from like immediately, like just the way that the compiler integrates with all of this. Uh, kind of IntelliSense stuff is way better than C++. And so because of that, I think they even have some tools where you can get like a, a class overview or something and it will show you, let me see if I can find that. Okay, well, look, turns out what I'm thinking of is actually like something that you have to add, but you can have like a class designer thing. Anyway, the point is there's ways for like, I'm pretty sure there's ways, I'm not sure if it's like a Visual Studio community feature that might be like an enterprise or a pro level feature, but you can basically like get Visual Studio to generate like a UML diagram or something. So you can get like a nice overview of your project. I've actually done that before when I was working at EA like ages ago on something I just wanted like a, di a huge diagram I could print in like A2 of just like what is going on here because everything was so complicated at certain certain points but anyway point is um if you're like aside from those kind of features you know you can always just collapse everything like this and then you can easily see what's going on here so this is my window class and it's got all of this like all of these kind of member variables and then it's got all of these functions so let's kind of go through this and think about the architecture mostly and that's what we'll kind of focus on in today's code review so first of all um you know we have these underscores now this is basically the equivalent of i don't know what i did there basically the equivalent of uh like m underscore you know that kind of stuff in c plus plus now the reason why it's actually kind of uh, written like this here, and this is a very common pattern for C Sharp programmers as well, is because you can start your variable names with underscores, which is not something you can do in C++. So in C++, because that's not allowed in C Sharp, a lot of people tend to just do this. Now, I still in my C Sharp code like to do M underscore. The reason why is it not only points to the fact that it's a private member variable like you would expect, but if something is static or constant, right? So if I had like a const or if I had a static, right? Then I can differentiate that by using S and C if I really wanted to. I don't really use C very often, but S is something I like to have, right? So uh, because of that, I still like to use that. But just if you notice a lot of that in C sharp code, it's because like that's kind of a common convention that I've seen a, a lot of as well. So the window class to me, obviously is supposed to be something that represents more or less like your game window, right? So I would use like the window class in Hazel, actually it might be nice to compare this to like some of Hazel's code. So if we take a look at like Windows window, which is like the window, obviously this is C++, but if we take a look at this class inside Hazel, and I'll actually have to bring up the header file, you can see what kind of stuff it contains, right? It basically contains like a GLFW window and it contains uh, everything around that, right? So in, in it, we'll probably like, you know, create a window, set the details, you know, initialize error callbacks and all of that stuff, create like a graphics context and a swap chain and everything so that we can actually render stuff and then set up like all of the events. Uh, so my point is that window classes typically obviously contain only stuff crucial to like the actual window so that you can get that set up and running. This class contains uh, you know, stuff as kind of far down as Bloom settings. So to me, that's a little bit too much. Now, the thing is, I know that you're using OpenTK and OpenTK, uh, OpenTK, like, you know, it obviously has like its own wrapper for basically all of this. Like the whole game loop is in OpenTK, right? There's no loop here even. Um, I mean, there's no loop in my window class as well in Hazel because we would be, we, that that's inside application. Application is something that kind of, uh, you know, application owns a window and then that's kind of the main window. You can have sub windows, but that's like the main window that's inside the application class and the application class contains that main loop and all of that. And it handles like everything it needs to, like everything stems from that class basically. Now uh, this, like that's why this almost looks to me like an application class that just happens to contain like a window. Um, although I know that like technically speaking, like when you call run, you know, your windows contain inside globals. So 
I don't really like this architecture because again, you're just making everything static. Now, I know that you're 16 and I know that when I was 16, this is what I did as well, right? So this is like, this is fine, you know? Um, you'll probably, you probably won't write code like this forever. My solution to everything back then was to just make stuff static. Why? Because like I was using Java back then. Um, so it's kind of similar to C Sharp, I guess. Uh, but I like, I didn't quite understand like object oriented programming and how like objects relate to each other, like what instances are, like all of that stuff. Like that didn't really click with me until probably a few months, like, or even a year after I started programming. So in the beginning, like in the first few months, I was just like, I have a variable. I want that to be accessible in another place in my code. How do I achieve that? What's like the the most kind of the, like the path of least resistance. And usually it was just make the variable static, right? Because if you make the variable static, then of course you can access it everywhere in your code base. Now, obviously that's not always correct. Not to say that it's wrong. Like, you know, um, certain things can be static obviously, but architecturally speaking, it's not always like a, a good thing to do. Um, which is why like, I mean, I wouldn't set up anything like this as well. Load, update, frame, render frame, and mouse move are all things that can just be owned within this window class. Like I'm not really sure why this has to be in a globals thing. Uh, like it, I don't see like this window, um, you know, which is the open TK window. I feel like that should just reside within this window itself or inside this class, but you could call the class application and everything could stem, could stem from there. And then if you wanted to access it, instead of making like a static class like globals, you could obviously like, because you only expect to have one application, you could actually make this like a singleton. So you could have something like public application, you know, get or whatever, or get app. And then that could just basically return your kind of S instance, which would be your like, you know, private static, application S instance um, that you would kind of initialize when you first like make your application. So that's actually kind of similar to how Hazel does it. For reference, if we look at Hazel's application header file over here, then you can see that we have this static application S instance. And then we have a function called get here, which just basically just dereferences the pointer and returns a reference to this kind of given application class. Why? Because that's something that like, obviously, you know, you only have one instance of the application, that's kind of your core. So it's fine to have this. Um, and this is where like people who start talking about singletons and like how bad they are, like, they have their place uh, and you know, there are obviously like stuff or maybe you just call this, I don't even know what you would call this in C sharp because you don't really need get as you can just use properties. You don't really get a like functions. But anyway, the point is um, it's fine. You know, you need stuff like this sometimes because how else are you gonna do it? You're not gonna design some convoluted weird thing that has to like stem down from like one point in your code base. You want this to be global and accessible everywhere because that's totally okay. Anyway getting on with this. So yeah, so we run this uh, and then let, so we were looking at this class. Let's kind of get back to that. So we have on mouse move, which is like, so again, these are just like events, right? And you can see it goes right into the camera system. So again, what I would do is you have a lot of stuff here already. Like why is the camera system not here? I feel like the camera system is in here because the camera system like, which is a uh, an internal class inside what inside camera. So actually hang on. So, and then this is a static function update mouse. Um, okay. Just wondering how deep to get into this. Cause it's uh, like, it's almost difficult to give good suggestions without rewriting like a lot of this and kind of walking through why, uh, you know, how I would kind of organize this architecture, but I'll try my best. So camera system, like camera system has just one function in it, um, called, and it's, uh, Okay, so you have a base system, base class, because that's something, uh, has a template argument or a generic argument of T, where T has to be a component. So base system is something that has, is a system that contains a list of components of a particular type. So camera system uh, is a base system that has basically camera components, right? So this contains a whole bunch of, uh, well, it's a system, so that makes sense, right? So the idea, obviously, with the ECS, and this actually looks like it's fairly well implemented, which is good to see, um, is this is a particular system that has a list of components, which it actually seems to own, um, which is interesting. I mean, it's more or less a correct ECS, though. So you have an array of tightly packed components, and then what you do is you go through and you update all of those components in one go. Right now, there are specific things here that apply to uh, certain components. For example, 
you're going to go through all of your components and update them with whether or not they're in shadow, which is a bit, you know, presumptuous of why, like why components would care about that. But basically camera system is just a system um, which will go through every single camera in the scene and do all of this stuff to it, which I guess kind of makes sense because update camera is going to be called from within window when you basically move the mouse. Well, it's actually called update mouse. Wait, that's in base system. Hold your horses. So camera system update mouse, right, okay. So camera system update mouse will actually uh, call this super Look, sorry, call this base method, which will do component update mouse. Okay, never mind, because I thought update camera. Well, it's the same thing, it's just I messed up my functions. So update mouse will call the update mouse um, function inside the camera class. So the camera class will have an update mouse function. Here it is. And that, but the thing is, because it's wrapped inside a system, this will happen for every camera in the scene. Right, so it's kind of a clever way to obviously structure everything and it's good because you're kind of uh, thinking in that kind of ECS way, the ECS mentality, where instead of having like, you know, entities packed together in an array and then for each entity, you go through every entity one by one and you like check to see if it has a camera and if so, update the camera, you kind of do all the cameras in one go. You kind of batch together everything that's related. So all of like all of each component kind of gets processed in one go. And that's really good. That's basically, um, that's, that's a really big step for optimization because what you're trying to do is you're trying to work on memory that's kind of related and tightly packed all in one go before moving on to a different block of memory rather than being all scattered. And we can talk a lot more about that um, and like the importance of the CPU cache and all of that in the future. Uh, but that's kind of good to see. Okay, good. So that's kind of that function. Let's go back to the window class. Okay, and then, then we just have random stuff like lerp in here. So, you know, put this in, put this in like a math file because this is obviously like a mathematical function. Um, so there's no need for it to kind of be in here. Uh, and then we have on load which is, so where does that on load? Is that something that we, we patch in here? So when the window decides to load, so that's why we have all of these events. Cause these are all like, this is a game window inside OpenTK and it needs to basically call back into client code. So it sets up events that you can hook into so that it, for example, inside its, um, its own uh, while loop, its own kind of uh, game loop, it will actually call into your code. So dispatch update frame, for example, will probably actually call you know, on update frame, uh, which will probably call this update frame invoke with the arguments and update frame is that action that we patched into. So we'll call our on update function. So architecturally, that's kind of how it all patches together. And again, that will update the camera system and then go into globals. If uh, you press the escape key, it will close. Okay, cool. So we basically have like an idea of all of this. Now, one thing I'm noticing here as well. So when you do the on load, uh, most of the stuff that you're setting up here is obviously to do with the renderer. So you're creating textures, you're creating render buffers, you're doing all of this stuff, uh, which render buffers are, okay, that's your own class, we'll get into that in a minute. But basically this is all stuff that obviously uh, I would expect to find inside a renderer. So it's really important because again, this is an engine, right? This isn't just like a graphics thing. It's really important to separate graphics and rendering a little bit from your core kind of engine and the rest of the engine systems. So the main window class that handles like what looks like the main game loop and all of that shouldn't be directly tied to like rendering anything really. I would expect this to be in a class called renderer and for it to be completely separate because aside from just crowding this class and making it like a little bit hard to read and just a bit messy, it also kind of means that you're more or less limiting yourself to having just one of these and you know, oh, why would I want to have more than one renderer? Well, you might want to have more than one viewport as an example, or maybe you want to maybe there's a need to set up a renderer that renders like something else. So as an example, like in Hazel, we can have a game view and we can have a scene view. Those kind of are, and we can have multiple viewports as well. But my point is when we set up like a, like the, the scene that is being played versus the scene that is just being edited, because they are physically different scenes, when we hit play, we make a copy of the edited scene so that we can play and, you know, do whatever we want in there without actually affecting the original editor copy. We set, we set up a whole new scene renderer for that. So that again, like 
apart from being able to switch between the two with no problem, it can kind of exist in its own little sandbox. And that's like, I think that's a really important architecture to have. So I would definitely kind of bring this out. Um, but otherwise, let's take a look at what you're doing here. So you're creating render buffers and render textures. So these are just OpenGL. This, so this is just an OpenGL texture. So you've written, this is your code, right? You've written a class here that is an OpenGL texture. It will create a texture of a given format. It registers it with the asset manager, which basically, I guess, just means that it adds it somewhere. Um, what does register actually do? Components add assets. So asset is a component. Oh, list. So asset manager just has a list of assets, but you've called it components because you've copied and pasted this from elsewhere. So call this like assets or something. But basically, yeah, you just have a list of assets. So it's not not much of an asset manager, but it, it it's a good start. Yeah, then we just this standard open gel boilerplate. Um, obviously there are specific things here like, such as like shadow. So it does this stuff specifically for shadows because we need uh, specific like texture comparison modes and whatever. But other than that, it, yeah, it just allocates some memory on the GPU and um, store nothing in the texture and we have a blank texture that we can use bind to buffer and all of that stuff and use will bind the image texture i probably won't talk too much about render api architecture uh, i'm planning to actually make a video about that where i'll talk about like how i like to write classes like this because the way that i used to write them and the way that i write that i write them now has changed like significantly and we can also use kind of hazel as a case study for that so i won't talk too much about OpenGL and GPU kind of stuff at the moment, but uh, this is fine. Like there's nothing too wrong with this. Um, and then render buffer obviously does the same thing basically, but we actually create frame buffers and then we can have look like multiple uh, multiple render attachments here so that we can basically um, draw to model more than one buffer at once, which is good, nice and modern. <laughs> um, and then yeah, we have specific stuff here like set shadow buffer, which obviously like you, you never really want to have stuff like that. You want it to be kind of like, um, if I had to mention something about this architecture, this is stuff that the renderer should do, not stuff that you should do inside like the render buffer class. So as an example, I wouldn't have this code here with a function called sh set shadow buffer. If you had a renderer class, you would have a shadow pass. And when you do a shadow pass and it's time to bind the specific shadow like render buffer, then you would bind it in like the specific way you want it. But again, that's inside the renderer. And that's really important, I think, because that means that the renderer kind of has uh, the authority to like use the data as it wants, because it's the thing that is facilitating shadow passes and shadow rendering in the first place, not the render buffer class. Like what does that know about anything, right? Render buffer is just supposed to be a container of data. It's supposed to be a buffer of data that we can either write to or read from right? That's it. Whereas the renderer is the big boy actually using that for good. Um, and so that's, that's something that I would definitely like consider in terms of like an architecture point of view is set up a render class and just do everything in the renderer. Like all the actual rendering code should happen in the renderer. And then these classes are basically just little um, utility classes that just basically will, you know, create like, you know, this stuff they'll create your actual frame buffers. Where are you creating a frame buffer? Frame buffer, render buffer here, and then render buffer storage, I guess. That will, it'll allocate memory to create your frame buffers and all that stuff, and maybe keep track of metadata like width and height, and resize them and do whatever. So it's a utility class, but the actual like, I now want to actually render some graphics or use this practically, that part you would basically do inside uh, your renderer class. So that's basically the biggest thing I'm noticing here. Other than that, so we go through, we load like shaders. Uh, I'm not going to look too much about at this stuff. We have a skybox. So how do we load the skybox? So get mesh from file is skybox and then the textures uh, over here, right? Base path for cube map paths. Oh, okay. So where is the resources? Resources, cube map. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, that's interesting. Okay, so looks like we're loading our cube map faces separately. So there's a few things wrong with this. Um, first of all, uh, splitting this up into six different files and loading it is incredibly inconvenient. There's a readme here. Ah, okay. Hummus.name. That's a trendy. Here we go. So yeah, so this kind of stuff, this is obviously like, this is what we call a horizontal cross. So this is a fairly standard cube map format. Now, you've looks like you've downloaded this and then split it up into all of these images or maybe i don't know maybe he's like the website downloads it like that i don't know but generally like it's good to 
try and, uh, you know, not load six different images just because as you probably noticed in your code, it's a bit of a pain having to go through, where was I inside the window class, right? Having to go through and create like six different paths and append all of this and then load all of that. Like that's a nightmare. I know this because I've done it before. And in fact, um, reading it from a, cute, from a map like this can also be a bit of a nightmare. In Hazel, we kind of do things differently. We load an equirectangular image and then we make a cube map out of it. Now, the second thing that's, that's an issue issue is uh, these are JPEGs, right? And these are 24 bit, bit kind of images. Uh, you definitely want to upgrade to an HDR pipeline and you want to take this kind of in as an HDR image. Now, again, this might just be given to you in a JPEG, but in general, oops, I moved that. Uh, in general, obviously we want to kind of deal with like a 16, 32 bit per channel so that we can actually set the exposure from within our engine rather than having to kind of bake the exposure into one like level of exposure like this, which is more or less what happens when you, you know, just use JPEG. So that would be my advice with that section. Definitely s switch to using .hdrs and then either and like, you know, in that horizontal cross format, so it's one file, it's easy to deal with. Or you can, if you're feeling very adventurous, you can write something that converts an equirectangular image, which is more widely available uh, in my experience. And then it converts into a cube map internally and all that stuff, just using computer traders. All right, so we do all the skybox stuff. Um, and then we have, yeah, like, so the skybox will have something like a material component, which probably provides a way, like this material component probably provides a way for it to get rendered. Right, so it kind of like sets a look for it so that we can set like certain uniforms. So materials are generally just like a shader and then it's uniform data and like any textures and resources it might have. So that looks like basically what you've got here. You have some shader settings. Doesn't look like there are, and, and a shader obviously, doesn't look like there are any textures associated with this. Maybe that's just not something you have, although I did see a rendered texture. Okay, and then we have a model renderer component as well, which probably just renders something. The only thing that I don't like about this stuff is that obviously like setting up a, setting up your renderer to be like inside an ECS, to me, it's not, there's not enough context, like model renderer, like, you know, if that's a component, like why is that a component? Because like, yeah, it's got, it's, uh, well, I guess that's not the actual renderer. The system does nothing. <laughs> Wait, model renderer. So model renders is a component. My point is, you know, when you do something like mesh render, which is, I assume we're eventually gonna to get to the code that actually does GL draw elements, which does the actual draw call, right? This, well, this in this case, this is inside a vertex array. But the point is what you end up with when you set up your kind of rendering code like this is everything is massively fragmented, right? I don't actually get to see how something gets rendered. I have to go through all these different classes and not only that, but when you get into more advanced rendering, you'll quickly realize that, hang on a minute, I need more control over what is going on because a lot of render passes are very different from each other, right? And so you basically wind up with this very bad architecture where you need to like, you know, make a, you need to make a, a bunch of functions inside Vertex Array to draw all of your different things or inside your model class and it's just all weird. And so that's why, again, I say no to all of that. You just have a renderer class and that just does all the rendering for you. Again, you wanna do the GL draw elements, you do that inside the renderer class directly, right? Instead of having to set up this object oriented thing where it just goes um, very deep. Now, I'm beginning to think it might be useful for me to make like just one 30 to 60 minute video that just shows this architecture in a very simple open GL kind of fashion. Um, let me know if you guys wanna see that in the comments below because that would explain all of this a lot more uh, rather than just me kind of talking and trying to do stuff with my hands as if that's helping. So uh, yeah, I, I might do that. Um, anyway, let's kind of start wrapping this up by taking a look at the actual render passes. Now you don't have much of an engine obviously here. It's mostly just a renderer. So there's not there's not a lot of stuff I can look at. If I just quickly go through the files, I don't think there's, there's much going on here. Um, you know, a lot of these are again using that component system of yours, uh, which is like, it's you're going down the right track, but there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be kind of improved there. Um, camera, debug. Okay, so we have like all these different textures, which are just like, so we have an interface with the texture or an abstract class, same kind of thing. Um, but we've got a bunch of functions, static functions here as well, and all of that stuff to handle like texture utilities, all very standard. You've even got a noise texture here that kind of generates some random pixels, which is cool. Um, uh, bloom settings, 
Uh, we'll look at Bloom in a minute. Compute. Oh, Compute. I wonder what you're doing with Compute. We'll take a look in a minute. Uh, and then Material System. And these are just settings like to set, I guess, for um, your material uniforms. Yeah, so there's, this is just a renderer. So let's go and actually take a look at the render passes, and I think we'll probably be done with this. So window on render. So let's see what we do. So if time is greater than 12, time is zero. OK, sure. What do we even do with time? Does time get incremented by like delta time or something? Sure. So what, every 12 seconds we look? OK. Um, <laughs> so we've got the rotation of some entity. See, this is like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, what on earth? So we have, and see, inside window, you've got your whole scene. So you need, you need, you also really desperately need, like, the concept of a scene, right? You need to be able to actually organize all of the data that actually exists within something in something. You also don't, because of that, like, the biggest problem I'm noticing here is you don't exactly seem to have a container for entities. Now, when you create an entity, and you add components to it. So this has a read-only list of components as well. And add component adds to there, but it also adds to itself. And then I guess the system will go through and actually render it or something. So whenever you're kind of lost with stuff like this, by the way, a good uh, way to go is to just, if like we know that the draw call happens here for the vertex array, right? And so because it happens here, if we just put a breakpoint here and just hit F5, like we know that we're gonna end up there. Um, and then from here, we can obviously take a look at the call stack. So when you're reading code, that's a very helpful thing. So if we go uh, over here, we know, so we have on render, which comes in from uh, model renderer system, which happens on render. So there it is. So we have that model render system, as I was uh, su suspecting. That calls um, the base system, which goes through every single component uh, with that kind of its shadow thing. And then uh, update will basically call mesh render, which will call like mesh data, which is that vertex array render. And then that kind of gets us here, right? So that's kind of how we go through and render everything. And again, like to me, like model renderer or whatever, like, you know, you'd be submitting meshes or something, and then that would do all of the rendering within the renderer, rather than kind of going through the ECS so deeply and then winding up inside vertex array. And then that does the actual rendering, which is like, that's a very common way to set stuff up, but it's just very kind of far from what I would call ideal and especially Actually, like it just does not scale well, that's for sure. Um, okay, anyway, so render buffer, uh, render bind, update render. Uh, all that stuff's fine. So, okay, so I'm a little bit interested in how you do. Um, so, what does cube manager update need to do? It's so difficult to read any of this just because. So, what is this? Cube map renderer. And then that has an update. So, that just does mesh render material component. Okay, so that maybe that's what renders like the backdrop or something. And then we have render bloom. Uh, so we do program use params, lot of mode, u texture, u bloom texture, dispatch, and then current MIP. Okay, so we go through all the MIPs and we dispatch a compute chair to Okay, so using compute bloom, First up sample. Okay, this actually looks very similar to Hazel's Bloom code. Let's take a look at the shader. So shader, bloom.shader. This is like, this is my code. This is like exactly the same as, this is actually, I wrote this code. Thanks, Sam, for the help with this method of bloom. Whoa, okay, let's back up a little bit. Let's just do a quick diff with Hazel's code. Okay, I'm serious, this is like exactly the same. Okay, so this is this is, this is is the, the bloom shader and this is Hazel's bloom shader, compare. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> what? Okay, so let's take a look at what's different here. So I'm using 32, they're using 16. That's the difference in that line. Push constants, because it's Vulcan. This is literally my code, but it's just been like slightly changed a little bit. This stuff, which like, again, I didn't invent like box down sampling 13 taps, but I did write this exact code. These are my comments, like all of this stuff and the way that I laid it out, that's all, that's all me. Obviously you can tell it's like identical. 
<laughs> um, what else? This stuff, again, is only different because the names have been changed. Wow. Well, I'm sure glad, I'm sure glad you got Sam to help you out with this. Now I'm not 100% sure if we, if like, if Sam is the problem or if you're the problem and you're just covering it like, yeah, thanks Sam for this code. Or if Sam was like, yo, I wrote a bloom shader just for you because you're my best friend. Here you go. Ah, oh, the shameless, the shamelessness. You know, it would have been fine if Sam was like, you know, thanks Cherno for this code. Let's just quickly add a little pull request to just have this in here. Well, what can I say? Bloom, fairly well done. I think it's, I think the bloom part is probably the strongest part of your engine. And I mean, even though I'm kind of saying that jokingly, I'm also not because obviously like this is a good way to do bloom. Like it's going through compute shaders, it's doing quite a lot of passes and all of that stuff, as opposed to, you know, the rest of the code, which is just like, um, you know, all inside the window class and doing, you know, who knows what. Now I will also, since we're looking at shaders, let's quickly take a look at some of the other stuff. I'm kind of interested in your main shader, which I guess is what default shader. So this is kind of like the PBR shader, um, which uh, yeah, see this looks quite different from my code, I think. So that's, <laughs> that's a little bit better. Okay, so we're doing like PCF, like the shadows did look pretty nice. It's hard to tell obviously, but the shadows did look decent. Looks like you're using PCF filtering for that stuff. And so I assume that you have some kind of uh, array with like PCF, like, you know, with the actual like noise values, or maybe that's what you were using the noise texture for. Cause obviously it has to be somewhat randomized in order to do that. But this is just fairly like basic, fairly like standard, uh, boilerplate kind of PBR code uh, with obviously like your Fresnel, Fresnel Schlick and all that stuff here. So because this is like an actual reflection, I assume this is like some kind of specular term. So this is actually like basically simulating like a crude reflection. Um, whereas this code over here, which is taking the ambient term from like the normal uh, at log 10 specifically. So this is like the irradiance, I guess. So you probably don't have an irradiance map and you're just simulating irradiance by taking the 10th uh, MIP from this. That's kind of your ambient term there. And then that's being eventually multiplied on. So that's our ambient light. That's our direct light along with like that specular reflection. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. And then we also output the normal over here, obviously. And then we have this LOC thing, which is the view frag position. So this is like the view space position, I guess, which looks like it pretty much, okay. It comes in from the vertex shader. Okay, cool. And, and this stuff is probably going to be used inside the uh, SSAO shader. So we take in those three textures over here, screen texture plus screen texture normal. And uh, well, no noise texture, but the, these, these two kind of give us our data that we need to actually, this basically just calculates like the level of occlusion based on how close we are to other geometry. Uh, and then that's what obviously uh, gives us that kind of darkening that we see. And yeah, I mean, really, obviously really simple. SSAO itself, which this looks like pretty much the most primitive form of it, is a really simple algorithm and it works pretty well. It has a lot of problems and there's a lot of better solutions, but this is actually like for what you get bang for buck, this is uh, definitely a pretty good algorithm. Anyway, that's pretty much tying up, I think this code review. Overall, well done. Bloom Shader is sus as usual. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed this code review. Let me know what you thought in the comment section below if you would do stuff differently. Let me know what you thought of the C-sharp code review. Thought I'd try something new today. If you want me to take a look at your code next time, then send it in to codereview at gmail.com. That email address and some instructions will be in the description below. If you are interested in the technical side of things that you see in these code reviews and you want to get better at like algorithms and all of that stuff, then definitely check out Brilliant using my link in the description below. I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.